today to, to hear from Pastor Robert Widow. He's uh, with the Central District of the Alliance as a chaplain. Uh, he's also a retired lieutenant colonel from Air Force. Uh, Robert, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Nice to be with you today. It is true. I am a retired Air Force chaplain. I spent my career as an Air Force chaplain, and uh, it was a wonderful ministry, and we loved it. We feel like we, we know you already. We have a lot of connections. We were friends with Rob and Janie. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I first got out of seminary, I went to the Huntington Alliance Church, and I was their youth pastor. And now, of course, Rob is the senior pastor there at Huntington. He had me back uh, probably a year ago to preach there, and it was just really nice to go back and see everybody and get reacquainted with people we hadn't seen in a long time. We saw Rob at uh, council a couple of weeks ago. He was hobbling around on crutches because, of course, he had surgery, uh, but he seems to be doing quite well. Not only that, but my wife is with me today, Diane and my two kids, Bob and Rachel. Uh, Diane was a missionary in Guinea, West Africa before I met her and stole her away from the mission field. And she worked with one of your previous pastors, the West Lakes. Uh, and Diane work together. So uh, I, I, like I say, we came here and we feel like we know you already with so many connections and you've all been so um, very generous and so very outgoing with us. Father's Day, what a great time to be together. I have a great Father's Day story. When I was on active duty, uh, I went over to the motor pool one day, um, vehicle ops we call it in the Air Force, and I was standing around waiting for something and there was a guy there. And uh, he saw me in my cross and uniform, and he said, uh, let me ask you a question. Are you a father? Now, that's a pretty typical question for a chaplain to get, because we have Catholic chaplains, and a lot of times people want to know if you're Catholic or you're Protestant. And I said to him, well, actually, no, I'm, I'm actually a Protestant chaplain. And he looked really strangely at me, and he said, well, anyways, have a good Father's Day on Sunday. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah, that kind of father. Yes, I am that kind of father uh, to two wonderful kids, and I'm glad to have them with us today. So all of you who are fathers, happy Father's Day to you. Before we open the word, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the way that you have dealt with them, ministered through them, used them over the decades to reach this community with the gospel of Christ. I thank you that they have a pastor who's coming back to them who will lead them and shepherd them and love them and care for them. Bless his ministry, I pray. And may Kingsway Fellowship have much better days ahead. We love you and thank you for our time together and pray that if we open your word, we will see you in a new and a dynamic light. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The year was 2011. I had just started as the wing chaplain at Randolph Air Force Base. The wing chaplain is kind of like the senior pastor. It was, I think, my first or second Sunday there. And I preached. And I was tired, so I went home and we had lunch. We were, this is in San Antonio, Texas. And I laid down to take a nap and my cell phone rang. And it was an unfamiliar number. So I picked it up and the person on the other end said, do you know a Pat Widow? Sure, Pat's my brother. Did you know that Pat was just involved in a horrible automobile accident uh, in Ashtabula? No, I had no idea. Well, he's been life flighted to Youngstown. Thank you. I called one of my brothers. He knew nothing about it. I called my other brother, who's a physician, and he said, I'm on the phone with the trauma surgeon right now. I'll call you back. Long and short of it is, uh, Pat was involved in a very bad automobile accident up near Ashtabula. So I flew home from San Antonio to be with them, and three days later, Pat died. They're in the intensive care unit at Youngstown Hospital. A couple days later, I was standing at the donut shop getting ready to get donuts to take home for uh, getting ready for the funeral, and I reached in my wallet and I pulled out an index card, and on that index card was this verse. We have this treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God 
will be evident and not from ourselves. And I stood there in that donut shop and I looked at that verse that I'd put in my wallet some months before and I thought, my brother Pat was a treasure that I never valued the way that I should have. He was a treasure in a breakable jar. That's our verse for today. Let's take a look at it. The first thing this verse says is that we have a treasure. What does that mean? What's he talking about there? We have a treasure. Well, if you look back at it and you look to the early part of that chapter and the chapter before that, what you'll see is that what Paul was saying was this. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came along, the people had the Bible. They had the Old Testament. They had the whole sacrificial system. But they didn't really understand it. I mean, they did all these sacrifices and killed all these sheep and goats and birds and stuff, and they thought it was to appease God. But it wasn't until Jesus came along that people began to realize that this was all foreshadowing the sacrifice of Christ. And so Paul says, in the Old Testament, their eyes were veiled. After Jesus, the veil was lifted. And we understood the working of God in the world. You'll remember when Jesus was on the cross in Matthew 27, it says that when he gave up the ghost, that veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Think about that. It wasn't from the bottom upward, which could have been somebody ripping it open, but it was from the top down. It was God tearing open that veil and exposing the very heart of God. He tore open the temple so that you and I can have access to the mercy seat. It's this knowledge, it's this ability to see and to talk to God like Moses did that is the treasure that is being spoken to in this passage. When did we get this treasure? We got this treasure when you asked Christ to come into your life and he came in and his Holy Spirit came in and that veil that others who do not know Christ, that veil that keeps them from understanding the word has been lifted from you and you have a treasure inside of you. I think there's another way that this word is used, this idea is being used. Theologians call it the Imago Dei, the image of God that is within each and every person. Believer, unbeliever, saint, atheist. It is the fingerprint of God that makes us as human beings more valuable than anything else in the world. We as people have what's called intrinsic value. Value by virtue of the fact that we are human beings. That means that the lowliest beggar on the streets of Calcutta is worth more in the eyes of God than the most expensive racehorse or the most pampered puppy dog because we are made in the image of God. You see, if I see a snake in my garden this afternoon and I kill it, nobody's going to get upset. If I see a prowler in my garden and I kill him, well, I could go to prison for that. Why is that? Because people have value. More so than any kind of animal or tree or rock or anything else. We are made in the image of the Almighty God. This image gives us certain inherent qualities that we share with God. We have a conscience because he has a conscience. We know the difference between right and wrong because he knows the difference between right and wrong. We live forever because he lives forever. We are made in his image, the imago Dei, the image of God in us. It is as permanent as anything could possibly be. It cannot be erased from you any more than your DNA can be erased. You will always be made in the image of God, no matter what you do. Now that image can be obscured and it can be clouded, 
You can look at some terrible reprobate who hates God, who hates life, who is slowly destroying themselves with chemical addictions and bad decisions and a nasty disposition, but they cannot erase the Imago Dei, the image of God. If they did, they would cease to be human. They would be less than human, and it cannot be done. So the treasure that Paul talks about is this image of God that is in us. It is a treasure. God loves us. He treasures us. He recognizes that when we fail, when we disappoint ourselves and we disappoint God, that he still loves us. We're made in his image. He can't help but to love us. Now today is Father's Day. Those of you who are fathers or grandfathers, I want you to know that your children are a treasure. They are made in your image. You are most like God. You are most pleasing to Him when you act like Him, when you love those whom God has given you to love. That's what it means to be his. Oh, now, you know, your kids may not always seem like treasures to you. They may do dumb things. They may bring home report cards you don't really want to see. Uh, they may drive the family truckster through the garage doll wall. Not that my kids would ever do anything like that, you understand. But you love them irrespective when they fail to live up to your expectations, remember this. Inside of that jar is a treasure. This Father's Day, please, act like it. Act like your kids need you, need your love. Our treasures, not because they are perfect, but because they are made in your image. I was blessed. Uh, with a wonderful father. I, I truly was. I grew up in a very Catholic home up just south of Cleveland. Uh, had five, there were five boys in the family, four brothers. Uh, and my dad found ways to spend time with us. He would take us to Browns games. He would take us fishing. He would take us to Canada. And you know, I never really thought about it, but in the early days of his career, when he was working 80 hours a week, he would take off exactly one weekend a year. One weekend a year was the vacation. And he would take us to Cedar Point. Now think about it. You work in 80 hours a week. You get one weekend off. What do you do with it? You go to Cedar Point and stand in line for hours and hours. Why? Because you want to? No. Because your kids want to. That's what a good father does. He does things that his kids want to do because he loves them. He would load all five kids and mom in a station wagon and go up to northern Michigan to spend two weeks at Uncle Steve's cabin on a lake when he was a little later on and could take the time away. Now think about that. If you had two weeks off, would you take five boys and go to the outback of northern Michigan? I wouldn't. But he did it because he loved his kids. Now further on down the, the road, they would go to conferences together, mom and dad, and leave us with grandma and grandpa, or they'd go on a cruise together. But we knew that dad loved us and loved his wife. James Dobson once said, the most important thing a man can do for his kids the most important thing a man can do for his kids is to love their mother. I think that deserves a hearty amen. So this treasure that Paul talks about here is a permanent part of who we are. It is the image of God that cannot be erased any more than the Imago Dei, the image of God. Now, not only is it a treasure, but Paul says, we have this treasure in clay jars. What in the world does that mean? Jars of clay? In what way does this great treasure that God has given to us, this insight into the world of God, this imago Dei reside in clay jars? Well, it's a metaphor. 
it is a picture of a fragile, mortal human body. In God's great wisdom, he did not choose the strongest and the best and the brightest to bring himself glory. He chose the base things of the world in which to fill his spirit. I'm always moved when I go to the airport and I look around and I see, you know, the beautiful people, the beautiful women and men, and I look at what are they reading? Uh, More often than not, they're reading People magazine, they're reading Us magazine, which is kind of like, you don't belong in Us magazine, this is for us. We're the beautiful people. We're the wealthy. We're the athletes. We're the zillionaires. You don't belong. They're healthy and wealthy in this world's goods in the pleasures of this world. And Paul comes along and says, God has placed this treasure in jars of clay. Folks, that's you and me. We're jars of clay. Listen to what Paul says elsewhere in his writing in 1 Corinthians 4.10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are, you are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed and roughly treated. We are homeless and we toil, working with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to reconcile. We have become the scum of the world, the dredges of all things, even until now. Paul is used to being considered a jar of clay. His detractors were always saying something about him, about his appearance, about how he really wasn't all that. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For they say about me, his letters are weighty and strong. But his personal appearance is unimpressive. His speech is contemptible. Can you relate to that? Can you relate to being in a jar of clay? If you can, I want you to know something. You're in good company. Listen to what they said about Jesus years before, centuries before he was born. They said that there was no stately form or majesty that we should look at him nor an appearance that would make us take pleasure in him. What's it saying? It's saying Jesus was made of a jar of clay. He wasn't beautiful. He wasn't sitting around reading Us magazine. He wasn't looking down his nose at people who look like you and me. He was one of us, a jar of clay. I want you to know something else about a jar of clay. Clay jars are very fragile and very breakable. When Paul says that we have this treasure in vessels of clay, everybody understood that clay jars in the day were the styrofoam cups. They they were just sort of throwaway kinds of things. Nobody kept clay jars forever and ever. Biblical archaeologists find tens of thousands of broken pieces of pottery in Israel because they were the throwaway uh, vessels. They were like styrofoam cups. Here's why. The law said that if a bug lands on a pot, it's now unclean, and it had to be shattered. So all these clay vessels were cheaply made. They were disposable. If something happened to it to make it unclean, it could be broken, and you could buy more of them. Imagine what your kitchen would look like if you had to break a dish every time uh, something happened to it to make it unclean. Well, you'd have lots of broken pottery, too. It's great if you make your living making pottery. It wasn't until later when they discovered um, ceramic coating, doing, doing a firing and putting ceramic on. Then the rabbis came and said, well, you know, now if a bug lands on your dish, you can scrub it with hot water and soap and it can become clean again. So the clay vessel that Paul's referring to here is the ceramic cup. It's the un finished stuff. It's the styrofoam cup kind of stuff, disposable, that filled the pantry shelves. It was disposable, breakable, common, temporary. That's what our bodies are. That's what your body is. 
That's what my body is. Try hanging out at the hospital sometime. You'll see the ultimate end of life. You'll see people in walkers. You'll see people on crutches and wheelchairs and piped in oxygen. Not to be morbid, but everybody is headed in that same direction. And there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, you can lose weight, you can go on a diet, you can watch what you eat, you can take vitamins, but that body of yours is still going to break down. It's just designed to be around for a certain length of time. My wife and I love to watch the sitcom Scrubs. I, I know sometimes it's a little bit crass, a little bit um, hokey, but, but there's always a moral at the end of the story. I remember one time, J.D., who's this young intern just out of medical school learning to be a doctor, and one of his patients dies. And he feels terrible about this. And he doesn't know what to do with this because he was supposed to help her. She didn't want help, and she died. And he's beside himself until his mentor, Dr. Cox, pulls him aside and says this. You need to understand that in the end, everybody dies. Everything we do, everything we do is an effort to forestall the inevitable. But that's all it is. This whole medical complex that we have with hospitals and hospices and nursing homes and everything forestalls the inevitable because everybody dies. You see, you and me and those we love are made of clay. It's fragile, breakable, mortal. In dealing with those around you, always remember they're made of clay, every bit as much as you are. We're styrofoam jars. We're not made to show forth the beauty of our bodies, but we're there to hold the beauty of our souls. One of the things I remember as a boy growing up in the Catholic Church was uh, on Ash Wednesday, my father would always take us to Mass before church. And we'd go to the service, and afterwards we'd march up front, and the priest would put ashes on our forehead in the shape of a cross. And he would look at us, and he would say in Latin, memento mori. That was a seventh grader. I don't know what memento mori was. What do I know? But you know what he was saying? Memento. A memento is something that you have to remember. You go to Niagara Falls, you get a coffee cup, or you get a picture frame or something. What is it? It's a memento. Something to make you remember. Morte. Death. What that priest was saying is, remember, you're going to die. From ashes you came, from ashes you will return, as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember that you are dust. To dust you will return. That's the message. We're styrofoam cups. As I get older, I realize I'm not going to live forever. Now, you know, I, I, I knew that we were all going to die eventually. I kind of thought it would be further on down the road, you know. I, I kind of thought by the time I went, there'd be flying cars and we'd travel to Mars for the weekend. And now I realize it ain't going to happen. My life is winding down. My time is limited. Fathers, I want you to know that you only have so much time with those kids. Make the most of that time. I read a great story in a Reader's Digest. This father was playing touch football with his kids in the front yard. And they were laughing and giggling and tackling each other and just having a great time. And mom came out and said, hey, 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 you're going to kill the grass. And dad looked up and said, we're not raising grass, we're raising kids. What a great answer. What a great answer. Father, you're raising kids. 
It's an awesome responsibility that God has given to you. Don't waste it. Why? Look at the end of the verse. We have this treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. When you look in the mirror in the morning and you see a new gray hair, a wrinkle that you hadn't noticed before, remember, you're made out of clay. You're passing away slowly. This is by design so that the surpassing glory of God is evident and not your glory. Conclusion. What have we said? We have a treasure. In this Father's Day, you need to know that those kids of yours, that family of yours, that father of yours is a treasure. That image of God is in them, and it is in you, and it is inerasable. We've also talked about how these clay jars are fragile. They're mortal. They're breakable. A reminder of the value of life, because it is of a limited duration. They are that way to remind us of the transcendent greatness of God. Barack Obama was our president, and in 2008, uh, he was speaking about Father's Day, and he said, fathers are critical to the foundation of the family. This from a man whose father was not at all involved in his raising. But fathers are critical to the foundation of the family. They are the teachers, the coaches, the mentors, the role models. They are examples of success, and the men constantly pushing us toward success. You know, they tell us that kids who grow up without a father, five times more likely to live in poverty. Five times more likely. Five times more likely to commit a crime. Nine times more likely to drop out of high school. 20 times more likely to go to prison. Fathers, the job you have is vital. What you do matters. It's important. And for those of you who maybe don't even have kids, or your kids are a disappointment, I want you to know that you too have a treasure within. The image of God planted within you, inerasable, permanent. It defines who you are. Let me remind you that this treasure is in a jar of clay. Let me remind you that God loves you. He values you. He wants you to value each other. Let's pray together. Lord, this Father's Day, this important day, this day to celebrate fathers in our lives, we lift before you. I thank you for all those fathers who have stuck around even when it's hard for those mothers who struggle on at times in single parenthood, for those who, who work so hard, for grandparents, grandfathers, and grandmothers, may we value them. May we see in them that image of God that is so vitally important. We love you, Lord. We thank you for giving us a treasure, and we thank you for putting it in jars of clay. And I pray that this day our eyes will be opened and we will learn to walk faithfully with you. Help us to that end, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen.
stand with us for our